Hello, I'm Alexander Lingus, the musical director of Capella Romana. It's my great pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend Nadia Tarnovsky uh, to speak with me about the concert that she's going to be conducting very soon, the Ukrainian wedding with Capella Romana. Um, so Nadia, welcome. Thank you very much for both for this opportunity and this chance to speak. Well, uh, I'm just uh, so excited that you're going to be with the ensemble this coming week. And um, can you just sort of tell uh, our audience here a little bit about yourself and uh, how you managed to get into this particular repertoire of music? Absolutely. Uh, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, so I'm a U.S. citizen. Uh, but my father was born in Ukraine in 1927. Um, my mother's parents were born in Ukraine at the end of the 19th, early 20th century and emigrated. My grand, my maternal grandmother emigrated when she was an infant. She didn't even know when her birthday was. She actually just picked a date because um, they officially didn't know. Uh, and then my grandfather came over when he was in his early teens. Uh, my mother was born here and uh, my father left Ukraine in 1942 um, it's interesting. He didn't have a birth certificate, but he did have a baptismal record that they brought with him, which was all written in Latin. Um, we found that document. It was very fascinating, <laughs> fascinating, but that was the document he took with him when he left uh, the country. And it was during the Second World War that they left. Um, uh, he didn't talk about that time period very much. I mean, he was 13 or so at the time. So he clearly remembered that Second World War period, but it was a very difficult time. Um, he ended up in England, of all places, and worked in a coal mine for a few years uh, in Cardiff, I think. I think he was in Wales officially. Um, and then uh, came over. Uh, in, an interesting story. He, he and his brother, sister, and the mother, my grandmother, went to England, but his father was not allowed to go. He was too old. Apparently, they had an age limit for people being able to come, and it was like 42 or something, and my grandfather was 44. So he ended up coming to the United States and ended up creating documents for them. And then they, they came over on a boat to the US and he met my mom here and they, they did what immigrants do. They you know, started a family, went to the local Ukrainian church and uh, he was very adamant about me learning Ukrainian. And so Ukrainian was actually my first language. Uh, and uh, I didn't start learning English until I had to go to school. Um, and they were, my parents are very active in church, sang in the church choir, did, and, you know, because they sang in the church choir, I sang in the church choir, and uh, they were very active in the community, and that's how I kind of got involved in Ukrainian culture, diasporically, if we want to say it that way. Um, and then in my teens, I, that was the first time that I heard the recordings of these women in the villages singing, and I thought, I don't know how they're making the sound. I don't know how they're doing this, but I was just captivated. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. And I went to Ukraine uh, when I was 19. It was right after the Soviet Union dissolved. Um, it was a weird world. <laughs> just because, you know, life beyond the Iron Curtain is a very kind of, it's, it's kind of like going through the looking glass. It's, a, it's kind of a strange place. You kind of expect things to happen in a certain way and they don't. Um, but the women in those villages, when I first met them when I was 19, and then subsequent villages, um, and then subsequent years, sorry, uh, they're just, they will give you everything. They are very welcoming. To, you know, you, you come over, you come out of nowhere, kind of knock on the door and say, you know, I'm looking for people who sing traditional music and, oh, you don't have to go anywhere. I sing traditional songs. And then you can go to Nina's house. She's, she's three doors down. She has a big dog. Just knock on the door and tell her that I sent her. And, and you go and then, and they'll say, oh, we'll come over tonight. We'll get a whole group together for you. And, and they do. And then they show up and they sing these songs, you know, deep into the deep hours of the morning. And you just kind of sit there and this music washes over you. And I swear, I say it rearranges your molecules. Those, when those old women sing and you sit there, it's just, you, you're changed after that. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's my background. That's how I came to this music um, or the music came to me, however you want to say it. I don't know which came first, but it's just, and yeah. <laughs> Well, but so presumably they you were exposed to a, a kind of a, quite a, a variety of different kinds of songs then. Um, so what what then sort of drew you specifically to the wedding repertoire? Oh, gosh, the wedding repertoire is so fascinating. Um, 
first of all, there's just so many songs. Uh, and um, there's a, there's just so many things. First of all, there's um, there's always, it doesn't really, it's kind of funny because you would think it would, it would be more um, divided by region, but it's not. There's always this sense of transition in that music, you know, or sometimes they sing and it's very minor, 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 minor. And then all of a sudden it goes major, 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 and then goes back to minor and then goes major and then back to minor and this back and forth. And I was just, I mean, I heard those harmonics and I thought, what is going on? Um, as you would think they would, you know, stick to a certain modality and <laughs> stay there, but they don't. Um, and it's really, the weddings are so much about transition. Um, I heard one scholar talking about the wedding and I've never heard it talked about this way. Um, and she said, you know, the bride and groom die on their wedding day. And I thought, oh my, this is morbid. That's terrible. What do you mean? They die on their wedding day. And she said, no, the, the life that they had as unmarried young man, young woman, disappears that doesn't exist anymore and they now become man and wife and they have different responsibilities within the community they move up like the the ladder within the village community and they're responsible for you know maintaining a homestead having children feeding those children teaching those children becoming truly like contributing parts of the community where you know as a young kid sure you're you're expected to contribute and help out and those kinds of things but the responsibility level is much different um, and so, and the songs themselves, when they talk about the bride and groom, they're really transformed. The bride and groom become the king and the queen of the day, or the groom is the moon and the bride is the star and, um, or they get decorated with stars and celestial things. Like you know, there's this one song where it says, you know, the mother is getting ready to lead the groom out through the door and she takes stars from the heaven and pins them onto his shirt so that he is ready to be married. I mean, that's just a beautiful poetic text. And I mean, I just fell in love with it. And um, I mean, there's all kinds, I mean, I like all kinds of Ukrainian music, but the wedding music specifically just really has this magic about it. Um, the other thing that happens, and this not only happens in the wedding music, but it, it does also happen here, is this idea of communicating with the ancestors, with those who are no longer here. Um, for example, one of the songs that we're singing on the concert talks about a girl uh, who goes to her mother's grave and says, I'm inviting you to my wedding. Will you please come and unplate my hair? Because there's this whole thing about the bride, her hair being done and then undone. In some villages, the hair gets cut. Um, like 99% of the time, the bride's hair gets covered with various kinds of cloths because, you know, she can't wear flowers in her hair anymore. Now she's married, so she has to cover her hair. Um, and here she is, she's inviting her deceased mother to come and attend her wedding. Uh, and you think, wow, that's kind of morbid. But there are many times in Ukrainian culture where the ancestors are ex expected to attend festivities. Christmas Eve is one of those times. You set an extra plate at the table and that's where the ancestors are supposed to sit. Um, on Trinity Sunday, women will go to the, uh, to the cemetery and they sing these songs called um, Plachi, which basically means weeping. And they're songs to the dead person. And they're basically songs like, you know, I love you. I miss you. Why did you choose to leave? I wish you, know, I wish you could still be here, but now I'm here without you. These kinds of songs. Um, and then there's songs also to the natural world. Those are usually done in spring when they call the spring and they do these loud hoops and hollers to send winter away and wake up the spring. So there's this communication with that which is beyond us, which is also really fascinating. Hmm. Well, one of the things um, that uh, is sort of different about this concert and some of some of the Capella Romana concerts, this is uh, an all women's concert ensemble that you're you're doing. And I wonder if you could maybe uh, just say something then about specifically the role of women in these wedding uh, ceremonies and and the music attached to them, because you just mentioned very much this sort of dialogue between um, uh, between a bride and her her deceased mother and. Uh, just if you could expand on that a little. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was thinking about that this morning because I knew we were going to have this interview. And I, I, I get various answers when I ask the women in the villages, like, well, why don't men sing these songs? Um, and, you know, there's probably about 15% of the wedding repertoire we'll actually hear men singing along. It does, it's not a big part of it, but it does exist. I can't say that there's none. Um, and I get various answers. Um, I'll get, oh, the men don't sing this part. or um, 
oh, they don't know how to do this. <laughs> Sometimes the other answer that I get, but, you know, in thinking about it, like the things that are involved in the wedding, making wreaths, making candles, embroidering shirts, embroidering towels, these are not things that men would generally do anyway. Like I can't see an old man sitting there embroidering a, a ceremonial wedding towel. It's just, even the women kind of look at it oddly, like what, what is he doing? But so you have all these things that women generally do and they gather making bread is another big thing. Um, and, and they rarely, rarely do they do those kinds of things silently. There's it's always accompanied by song. And so when I was thinking about what kind of project to do that would really focus on women's voices in that way and which like already naturally occurs in that state with many, many women singing. This just seemed like a natural fit. And also this happens later. This happens after the wedding ceremony because the parts that we have for this concert is the lead up to the church ceremony and then the church ceremony. But then there's so much more that happens after. Um, and after the ceremony, like, people will break off in groups where the old women will sing about the young girls and the young girls will sing about the old women. And then maybe the women of one family will sing about the women of the other family. And so there's all these little groupings that happen throughout this whole uh, ceremony. And even things like making the wedding bread, um, you have to be a very specific kind of woman to make the wedding. Not just anybody gets to show up and make the wedding bread. Um, you you need to not have any children have no you can't be a widow if you're a widow forget it um if you've had any children who have passed away you're not allowed to make um um the poverty one they kind of look at i mean what defines poverty in ukraine is very variant like if you have a cow you're wealthy you know you might not have a lot of money in the bank but you have cows and chickens that's wealth <laughs> in a village um so you have to have you know a reasonable amount of sustainability I guess within the village community and that those women are the ones who are allowed to make the bread because they're also in singing of the songs together and like who they are as people they're incorporating a certain kind of magic into that bread as well so that the young couple who are getting married won't have any children that pass away or they'll live a long life together before either of them are are widowed or separated from their partner it's, those are the kinds of beliefs that go around there so I don't know if that answered your question. Well, yes, no, no, it did. And, and actually, um, you've uh, also sort of touched on a little bit the, the kind of the, the breadth of the repertoire. Um, and uh, in your notes, you mentioned that you've selected from uh, multiple regions as if people, you know, were coming, the bride and the groom and their families come from different parts of Ukraine. I wonder if you might just sort of tell us a little bit more about the regionalization of, of these songs. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, the very first time I went to Ukraine, I was 19. Um, and the man who met me at the train station, I was staying at his home. Uh, and we started talking about folk music. And he said, oh, folk music in Ukraine is so dependent on the land from which it comes. And I was like, well, it comes from Ukraine. And like, he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, if you go to the mountains, you know, the mountains are rocky and jagged and bouncy and the music of the mountains is like that it's like da da di da di da di da 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 di da da and he goes and if you go to the steppe region which covers like 40 percent of the country he goes there's this wide step and you can just sing and the echo just carries and so the songs in the steppe are like they're just long and wide and and then if you go to northwestern Ukraine, which is known as Polisia, there's this, it's, it's a fascinating, it's a very sandy ground, ground, but it's somehow it's also swampy. It has lots of lakes and people collect berries and mushrooms in the forests. And that sound there is super, super nasal and focused. And they said, well, you have to sing like that because if you get lost in the forest, you need to be able to call and have people hear you and find you where you are, which is not something you would need you know, on the steppe region and all of these different regions. And it's ref that's reflected in the music. And um, when I first started <laughs> learning this music, just like not knowing anything, um, people would say, oh, no, 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 you're singing that song like you're from the steppe and that's from Polisia. You need to sing it like it's from Polisia. And I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> then when I, you know, then when I started you know, really meeting these women and listening to the dialects and listening to the ways that, and recreating the ways in which they sang it made all of the difference it was like well you can't sing that song like that it's 
that's odd. It sounds funny. I mean, now I hear it. When I, before I was, I had no idea. But each of those regions has a very distinct kind of sound, um, distinct kind of dialect. Uh, for example, in Polisia, the, the palatized S, they don't do it as much as they do in other parts of the country. So, um, so for example, like the word povernutesia, which at the end has that sia sound. In Polisia, they would say povernutesa. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just kind of, it changes how, it changes how you say it and changes how you sing it. And so each of those little regions um, has their own distinct thing. And I know there are some folklorists who would look at this concert and go, she's lost her mind. Because what they would do is they'd probably pick one village or one region and go, okay, we're doing wedding songs from the Chetney Hube region and that's it. Or we're doing wedding songs from the Carpathians and that's it. And I wanted, I really wanted this concert to show kind of the breadth, and a bigger breadth and scope. It's not even close to what's all there of what's happening in Ukraine and how people sing there and the kind of music they have there. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to do. And so the response that I get from most fol folklorists who look at it and go, hmm, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> it's not something that they would consider doing. I suppose if you're if you're a folklorist and you're you're then you would just have a different chapter in your book. Yeah. You know, <laughs> to cover these things or or a chart yeah. or something like this, but in a in a you know live musical situation, there's no other way to do it. Yeah. Right. Well, that even happened in this concert because there's one song that's done as a solo, and Ina Kuftun, who is singing on this concert, who's from Ukraine and currently living in Portland. She said, you know, that solo should really be come, you know, at the end should be the end of the first half. It should be after this song. And I said, you know, I can't put that there. And she said, why not? I said, because it's a concert. That would be the last song of the first half. It's, you know, we want to end with this choral number and like multiple part harmony and everybody's going for it. Like, that's how you want to end the first half. You don't want to have that song and then go, okay, now this person's going to sing this little solo. It just doesn't work. So, you know, it's in a different spot than it would happen traditionally at a wedding, but in terms of programming for the, the concert, it, it fits much better for oh, but, but there is an overall flow into it because I mean one of the things I noted in the um, in the way that you programmed this that the um, succession of days you know that this is a multi-day project the wedding and I wonder if you could sort of tell us a little bit more about how that works. Absolutely, um, yeah. It really it's funny because they're like three days minimum but it really should be like six or seven or even ten <laughs> and there there are some villages where um the week literally a week after the wedding is they'll all get together and sing a few more wedding songs and then the wedding is done so it, like you can take up to two weeks depending on where you are um but it will start it starts like actually really starts like about a month earlier, like the young man, young girl kind of know they want to get together and they go through this process called Svatinya, which is the engagement. Um, and the young man will very ceremoniously show up at the girl's house and she either accepts them or doesn't accept them. And there's, you know, all these. So it's there's a lot of humor in Ukrainian culture. So there's a lot of teasing, making fun of people. Um, that's just part of the game. You know, that's just how they do it. They, and so if she likes him, she will give him embroidered cloths and says, yes, you know, I'll happily marry you in about a month. Uh, and if she doesn't want him, she gives him a pumpkin. And then he has to very ceremoniously walk back through the village with this pumpkin. And everybody knows, oh, well, that didn't work out. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, and then there's no hiding anything in a village. It's very much, everybody knows exactly what's going on. So if, you know, he does get the embroidered cloths, then the week leading up to the wedding, all kinds of things start happening. The home of the bride and groom gets decorated. Paper flowers are used. Embroidered cloths are used. Um, candles are made. They're very ceremonious candles that are part of various rituals and parts of the service. So those need to be prepared. The brides always wear these elaborate flower headdresses. You know, stuff for that starts needing to be gathered. So pretty much when, uh, weddings always happen on a Sunday. So the lead up to that Sunday is there's a lot of preparation happened. Definitely by the Wednesday before, everything's been decorated and put together. If there are any animals that need to be slaughtered, because, you know, this is how people get their meat. They don't go to you know, Whole Foods and buy some pork. They, you know, and they'll, they know ahead of time. They're like, oh, there's going to be a wedding. We need to, you know, fatten up these pigs. We need to have so many chickens ready. We need to have this and this and this. Like they're 
very forward thinking. And there's so much bread and baking that and like all of the cooking. It's like getting ready for Easter, really. It's like there's just so much cooking that has to happen. People start doing it way ahead of time. Uh, and then as we get closer to the wedding, things start ramping up. Um, flowers need to be gathered for this headdress. And, and then on the day before, the, the bride will get all dressed up and with her bridemaids and she will go house to house and invite everybody from the village to her wedding. If somebody has passed, she will also go to the cemetery, make sure that, that those members of the family get invited as well. It's very ceremonial. And on that evening, she will also do something, they'll participate in something called Givich Vachid, which is kind of like girls' night. And some people think, oh, she has a bachelorette party. And like, uh, no, <laughs> it's not like that at all. Um, the, those are, that's when stuff gets finished. Like anything that needs to be added to her trousseau gets tossed in there. Um, the wreaths get made. Um, there's lots of songs about how she's going to be moving into her new family and how her mother is not her mother. Her mother-in-law is not her mother. Her father-in-law is not her father and her life is going to be very different. Um, those are generally very sad <laughs> kind of songs. Uh, and so there's that preparation. Um, sometimes they bathe the bride and groom the night before. Sometimes they do it the morning of, it depends. Um, and then on the morning of, there's additional blessings that happen. You know, the groom will come to the bride's house, the bride will go to the groom's house, they get blessed by parents and friends, and then they can finally go to church. <laughs> they have the church ceremony. And then this is the part that's not on the concert, um, because it tends to be a little bit more body. <laughs> and I know you know, Capella Romana is essentially a, a, a sacred ensemble who does a lot of sacred music. And then also, I mean, most of our venues are churches and singing body songs about what the coupling of the bride and groom was going to be like just didn't seem appropriate. So I kind of, we stopped it at the God grant them many years. <laughs> we left it there. But there's this whole series of songs, which it's very funny because the old women don't like to sing that song when you're there like two o'clock in the afternoon recording them. And they're like, oh, you're recording this. These songs are kind of inappropriate. And it's like, but at you know, one o'clock in the morning on the wedding, they're singing them <laughs> at the top of their lungs without any issues. And, um, you know, people might wonder, well, why would they sing dirty songs? And it's like, it's not about, you know, saying foul words, or, but the actually the young couple doesn't even go to their bedroom in order to consummate their marriage. They go to where the grain is stored because that is supposed to give them extra fertility on that first night. So this poor married couple is in like some kind of empty silo. The whole village is, <laughs> the whole village is outside. It's called the Komora. The whole village is outside singing these body songs about, oh, the gander's going to crawl on the goose and like, all of them, you know, I mean, these are agricultural people. They see cows, you know, cows and bulls coupling chickens and roosters. They know what's going to happen. And so they just sing about those things in song. But it's really there to help that initial meeting of the bride and groom in this way to be fertile and to like to have children. This is what we want. We want to have this coupling to generate some kind of result. <laughs> so that's what they do. Uh, and that party, that wedding night party, it can last Sunday night <laughs> through Monday morning. Sometimes, I mean, it depends on how much food they have, how many people they have. How many people have come out of town? There's always a celebration. You know, is there a feast day? Oh, good. We can celebrate even longer. We don't have to work. It's a feast day. Super. The wedding continues. Uh, and then when all of that has finally died down, one of my favorite parts uh, is that the bridegrooms will come to the bride on, you know, the morning when everything is all finished. And they sing these songs of farewell, which are these heartbreaking songs. The texts are like, you know, I go to the chest that you know has my trousseau in it and I empty it out and I take my maidenhood, my girlhood, and I put it out onto the bed. And I ask these bridemaids to take whatever is left of my girlhood and take it, divide it among themselves, take it with you because I'm no longer a girl and I can I can no longer have this part of me. And it's just like, oh, <laughs> and they're just such... Um, they're just heartbreaking, <laughs> these songs. And then they say farewell to each other because, you know, sometimes she's moving to another village and she'll only get to see each other on major holidays or at certain times of the year. If she stays within the village, she'll get to see them more. But she's still, again, she's in a different, 
a different kind of social class than where her friends were. And so, you know, they'll go out and party with the young people by the lake or something. And it would be inappropriate for her to join her friends at that spot now because she has different things to do. And then, as I mentioned, in some places, like a week after that event, people will gather one more time and sing, you know, a few more wedding songs and really kind of seal the deal. But there's, it's, there's a wealth of music there. And it's also very kind of, some of the texts, not all of them, are very kind of step-by-step -step directions. It's like, you know, Halya, now it's time for you to sit on the bench. Your mother will come and sit next to you. Now it is time for you to choose your bridesmaids. You know, this is your time to do this next part of your life. That was the other thing I found fascinating about those songs is, you know, how much of the ritual could be actually held just because it was actually part of the music. And it just told you what you needed to do. So even if you had never done it before, never seen it, you just listen to the text and go, okay, it's time to sit down. Okay, it's time to walk around. Okay, it's time to take somebody's hand. Oh, it's time to get our hands tied with a, an embroidered towel. Okay, and you just follow the music. It tells you what to do. Marvelous. So you did well. So the place where you actually are ending is in fact sort of in church. So you've had the sort of everything up to that. And could you just say just a little bit about the kind of uh, sort of more strictly sacred liturgical part of this concert? Yeah, that was that was interesting <laughs> because you know I've been singing church music forever since I was you know five years old, um, and choosing like what you wanted what I wanted to be a part of this and what I wanted to represent like Ukrainian choral sacred music um, was a bit, so, you know, I started, actually I started with a composer named Kirillot Stetsenko. And the reason I started with him because I knew that he had composed some Christmas carols in a very kind of folk style. And I thought, you know, I wonder if he's composed a liturgy. Sure enough, he did. Uh, and he even named one of his liturgies the folk liturgy. And I thought, well, perfect. <laughs> It sounds like where I want to be. Um, and so we are doing a piece from his folk liturgy. It's the one that happens at the end. Um, it's the um, the Chesnishu, which is, um, you know, mo more, more, great, honorable than the more honorable than the cherubim. <laughs> yes, that one. And that one tends to be sung fast everywhere because it's like it's the end of the service where it's like, oh, we made it. <laughs> It's time to sing this and get out of here and we're done. Um, you know, and it has those quick Lord have mercies at the end and, you know, glory be to the Father. And they do it that quickly. They're like, glory be to the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, now and forever, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. I mean, and you're done and then you go. Uh, so I started there. I thought, well, this is great. Super, he's got a folk liturgy. Um, the other one that I looked at was just a fascinating character in Ukrainian choral music by a man by the name of Alexander Koshitz. Um, he led the Ukrainian National Choir. And Ukraine had this tiny sliver of independence um, near the end of the First World War, like 1918-ish, right before the, um, uh, the Russian Civil War with the Bolsheviks and the, the White Army. And so they had like, I don't know, nine, 10 months where they're like, wait, we're an independent country. And then the Red Army came in and went, no, you're not, <laughs> you know, taking over. Um, but in that little sliver, uh, the very first president of Ukraine, Khrushchevsky, said, you know, what I want is I want people to know that we exist as a country because, you know, we didn't have internet at that time. You couldn't put things out and let people, there was, there had to be a way to get the word out. And he said, you know, we have this choir and they should go do a world tour and let people know that Ukraine is an independent country and this is our culture and this is what we should be doing. And Alexander Koshitz happened to be the con conductor of that choir and that's what they did. They took this group of people, they performed at Carnegie Hall of all places. Um, and that was when Carol of the Bells was first heard in the United States and um, you know, everybody went crazy over it, went, well, this is great. <laughs> you know, I mean, There's another, I don't know, urban legend that they also sang this lullaby um, which George Gershwin heard, and that was the basis of his summertime. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, that's out there. There's That's mm -hmm. that legend that's out there. Um, but then this is kind of like the movie The Terminal. While the choir was on tour, the Bolsheviks took over, and then the Ukrainian nation was, like, no longer the Ukrainian nation. So they were like, we don't have a home anymore. What are we going to do? And the choir decided to gather their own funds. And they're like, no, we're gonna continue the tour because we still have a culture, we still have a nation, we still have this, this thing to do. And Koshis ended up living essentially kind of in the New York area. 
But then he also, I don't know why, ended up traveling to Winnipeg, Canada and like doing a variety of workshops there. And there's a choir that's named after him right now that exists in Winnipeg that's been around for years. They, you know, it's like a 40 person choir that sings <laughs> Ukrainian music of all, you know, varieties and genres. And so he's a fascinating figure because he's, you know, he's he's a diaspora person. You know, he's somebody who started out in Ukraine and then ended up being pushed out of his homeland for a variety of reasons, but then kept making music. And he wrote like four or five liturgies. And and the, I just picked that Alleluia from his, because I was looking at a couple of different of all, of, and it just it felt bouncy and fun and very celebratory. And, I, you know, a lot of this music can be very, uh, oh, you're going to go live with your mother-in-law and your life is going to be so hard. It's like, I just wanted something a little bit more. Um, fun <laughs> I guess is the way to say it um I'm trying to think oh and then I thought you know what else would they sing in the village because they wouldn't necessarily sing the you know the the Quashitz Alleluia it's written for four-part voices it's um it's got some interesting uh rhythmic shifts and things like that that probably wouldn't happen but what they would sing in the village is you know there are the liturgical tones in which all kinds of things get set to those tones. And I, so I included a few pieces that were, were based on those liturgical tones because that felt very, very folky to me, even though it's not, that would not ever be considered folk music by any stretch of the imagination, but it's definitely something that they sing in villages. And so there are those. Um, and then I just, uh, I think the other piece, that, oh, there's a couple interesting pieces. There's one piece, we did a Bohoro de Sidivo, like a Hail Mary, just because, Mary is very prominent in the church ceremony because in the wedding ceremony, and it's interesting because there's a few mentions of Christmas in this, and you're wondering why are they talking about Christmas at a wedding? You know, this doesn't make any sense. But all of them are like, you know, rejoice because the virgin will has conceived and she will give birth to a son named Emmanuel, which is exactly what we want the bride to do at the end of this whole process. We want somebody to, I mean, she's not going to give birth to the savior, but she will conceive a child and it'll be very celebratory and very Christmas-esque. And so Mary figures quite prominently in the, in the wedding service because, you know, she's the one who's giving birth and she becomes kind of like the female figure. Um, and then the last piece, the the Nohailita, the many years, I actually learned that piece at a, at a liturgical music conference that was being held here in Ohio. Uh, I went to it. And I was like, wow, this is a good Nohailita. Because you think you've heard all the Nohailitas. <laughs> like, you know, you sing through them all. You're like, okay, there's this version. There's this version that sounds like a Sousa March. There's this version that does this. And, and I heard this one. I was like, wow, this is bouncy and fun and I've never heard this one before this is brand new uh and I spoke to the priest from who I learned it and I was like you know I'm thinking of including it on this wedding concert and he said where did you find this piece I said I got this piece from you how can you not remember <laughs> you gave this to me that's why I'm talking to you right now and he goes this is a composer from Finland <laughs> and I was like what? what how is he writing you know, God grant this many years in this very kind of Eastern European style. And he goes, well, there's a big Orthodox church in Finland. Um, and, you know, and so he's writing music for them. And I thought, okay, do I include music by a Finnish composer? Is this like, <laughs> is this the wrong thing to do? But I mean, aside from the fact that I really like the piece because it's so bouncy and fun. Um, it's just, I just thought, you know, how many Ukrainians, again, like Koshits, who, you know, have to live outside of their borders now, because in Koshits' time, it was because the country no longer existed. But in our current time, it's because their city has been bombed to bits, or it's safer for them to live in Poland or Czechoslovakia, or in the case of one, one of our singers in Portland, and in the case of another of our singers in Chicago, you know, on these on this refugee status and having to work in a place that's not home, but in a place that also you can find find places where you do belong. You know, I would think if there is, you know, a Ukrainian person in Finland, going to church would be a place where things would be familiar, especially, you know, it's an Orthodox liturgy. It follows the same program. We're kind of like, you know, we have this and this and this. And even if they sang it in Finnish instead of a Slavonic language, you can figure out exactly what's going on and know where you are and feel like, okay, you know, this is, this is a place I could be. And I thought, okay, for those reasons, we're going to keep this Finnish composer right where he is. And 
that's where it's going to be. And so those are the choices behind the, the liturgical part. Um, some of them were happy accidents. Like, you know, I just happened to look into a book and in somewhere and that, or I just, for example, I went to this conference and I heard this piece and thought, oh, that works. That was a completely happy accident. Um, and other things were definitely like, oh, I must include this song or, oh, I really love this song. Or this one has really cool harmonies that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. So we have to keep this one. Um, Oh, marvelous. What, what a, a, just a, a rich tapestry that you've woven here. Um, well, thank you so much for chatting with me. And I'm sure that those who uh, are going to be there for the concert are really, really going to enjoy this, the, the variety, the richness uh, of the different styles and idioms, uh, just how marvelous. So uh, just reminding people that this uh, concert uh, will be performed in Seattle, Washington on the 19th of May, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. at St. Demetrius Greek Orthodox Church. And then the next night, Saturday, 20th of May, 2023, at 8 p.m. at St. Mary's Cathedral in Portland, Oregon, and also with a matinee uh, concert the next day at, in Milwaukee, Oregon, at Christ the King Parish at 3 p.m. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, you have one thing. Can I add one thing? Yes. Can I add one thing? Um, it is available for streaming. Uh, afterwards so yeah, I do have there are some people in Ukraine who are like we want to see this concert are you streaming it I said yes we are they said do we have to watch it at the time that you're actually doing it because at that time it would be something ridiculous like you know four o'clock in the morning in Ukraine and I said no you can watch it whenever you want to watch it you just and uh, so there's some very very excited people across the pond especially in Ukraine who are very interested and excited about this concert and are so grateful that Capella Romana has, um, has the ability and has made the choice to make it available to those who could not physically be in the Pacific Northwest. So thank you for doing that. No, in, indeed. Oh, thank, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, digital on demand. It's still fairly new for us, so I'm, get, I'm getting used to it myself. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to speak with you and just to learn about all this wonderful thing that you're going to be doing uh, coming up. Thank you so much.